It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Boom. You're listening to America's Voice Now. My name is Michael Evans. We're in our third segment of the day. This particular topic is going to cover the Federal Reserve the traders of the central banking world, our own personal trader from the House, John Boehner, who appeared and attended their event, and the lapdog mainstream media, who will refuse to cover it in its entirety because they were invited as lapdogs. And uh, our next segment will cover uh, the MLK Memorial, Martin Luther King Memorial, and the absolute uh, breakdown of race relations in the United States and how that is being encouraged by these um, racial uh, benefactors. They're charlatans, including our president, by the way. All right. The annual meeting is held in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. It occurred this past week from the 22nd to the 24th. It's sponsored by the Federal Reserve. The uh, mainstream media gave it a collective yawn. Why? Well, because they were told to shut their mouth. Don't write about it. Don't talk about it. Throw out there any discussion you want about who's going to replace Bernanke, but don't talk about Jackson Hole. For the record, Bernanke missed it. It's the first time that a Fed chairman has missed the annual meeting in like 24 or 25 years. Media reports have downplayed the significance of it, of course, because they were ordered and told to. And the, um, the goal of the, the discussion at this particular event was uh, how are they going to start tapering back and, and narrowing down their um, QE infinity? In other words, how are they going to unwind what they've wound? And how are they going to do that without inflation hitting Jimmy Carter 21% levels for housing? I don't think they are. I think the real topic here, which is the one that they don't talk about when anybody's in the room that might be able to actually report, is how much longer can we hold out before this entire thing folds like a house of cards on a windy day? Right now they're buying $85 billion that's the B number per month of federal treasuries. What that means is that we are essentially buying back $1 trillion of debt per year through the Federal Reserve. And since our deficit is about $1 trillion, that ought to tell you something. You know what it tells you? It tells you that the rest of the world is no longer interested in buying American debt. And that ought to scare the pants off you. It means that we're buying back our own debt because nobody else is willing to buy it on our behalf. It means that we are, uh, for all intents and purposes, buying one trillion of our own debt and printing the dollars to put that out into the marketplace, which means that we are uh, we are putting liquid cash into the marketplace, and based on the rules of supply and demand, your dollar value is dropping every single day. And it's dropping at the rate of a trillion dollars a year on under uh, across the entire uh, money supply. So they also talked about who's going to replace Bernanke. I'm predicting right now it's going to be Larry Summers. Why? Well, because Larry Summers is a longtime trader and a longtime friend of this administration. And Larry Summers is a um, 
a lapdog for this administration. And he has been a loyal member of this group for a very long time. Uh, he is a, you know, he is a, um, well, I'll put it to you this way. David, uh, David uh, Leonhardt from the uh, New York Times wrote this. It goes like this. To undo the rise in equality in income equality since the late 70s, out, every household in the top 1% of the distribution, which makes $1.7 million on average, would need to write a check for $800,000. This money could then be pooled and used to send out a $10,000 check to every household in the bottom 80% of the distribution chain, those making less than $120,000. Only then would the country be as an economically equal as it was three decades ago. Um, what are the odds of that happening? And how is it that this is the kind of concept that Larry Summers sponsors and supports? Larry Summers is the wrong guy for the job for a lot of reasons, but he's going to get approved because Obama wants him approved and Congress has completely capitulated. And in addition to that, to make matters worse, um, the area that, uh, the area that he's got to get approved by is the Senate, right? So since that's in the hands solidly of the Democratic majority, we can expect that whatever Obama wants, he's going to get. Now, the Fed uh, listed the, the, uh, the, the following media attendees from the major networks. Here's what it was. The New York Times, the Fox Business Network, Peter Barnes was the correspondent there. That's the faux business network, by the way, for the record. The Market News International, the Associated Press, Reuters, Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, Dow Jones Newswire, Bloomberg TV, Washington Post, and Bloomberg News. The problem is that those are the same organizations that have been covering up the tracks of the Federal Reserve for the past 100 years, for those of that have been in business that long. And what we do know is that the global economy is literally teetering here on the brink of explosive doom. And these bankers are engaged in an attempt to try to figure out how they can continue to utilize inflation to, to, to be the hidden tax uh, and the theft of America's financial resources. What they're planning on doing, by the way, is what, and, and, and I guarantee you that this discussion happened in Jackson Hole, is the same thing that they just did in Greece when they nationalized the, the accounts from those people who had, you know, above a certain depository number in a bank. And they used that money to make those banks whole. Really? So you're going to tell me that you're stealing depositors' money if they have above a certain limit, demonizing the rich. And you're going to confisc confiscatorily take that money and use it to make a bank whole, a bank as a, who's a private enterprise who had nothing to do with the wealth that that person or, 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 or individual generated. Hmm. Sounds a little like gangland uh, protection to me. Maybe not. Maybe it's just plain armed robbery. <laughs> I mean, there's no. I mean, there's no difference. And then they froze the accounts to keep those people in Greece from moving the money out. Really, they froze the accounts so that if you had like a million and two in the bank and you and and you were one of the targets, you couldn't even get the money out. And then they confiscated forty percent of it. And then they turned around and took that forty percent and they said to the bank, "You can take forty percent out of every account that's got over dollar X, and then you can put that in your own pocket." to make yourself whole. Wow. Pretty amazing. Government sponsored, might add. Here's the problem. They're going to continue to steal money from the population of the United States in the case of the Federal Reserve and every other country in the case of their own central bank. But trust me when I tell you that this private cabal of bankers is owned by many of the same people, irrespective of what country or central bank system we're talking about. And it's worthy of note 
that every time there's a country that does not utilize central banking, therefore allowing these monsters to control their economy, they're demonized and, and we go to war against them. Afghanistan was the latest in that, and so was Iraq. Iran is another one, and I'm not advocating Iran's anything other than whatever they are. But I am saying that they don't like the fact that Iran does not have a central bank system that they can manipulate. And so that's one of the reasons why you keep hearing all this trumpeting of, you know, we've got to have access to we've got to have we've got to take Iran out and, and you know, regime change and all that, because what they want to do is put in a player who's, you know, a yes man to their demands for central banking. That all falls back under the IMF and all the rest of that. Jim Rogers, who's an investor and an author and a commodities, you know, multi-gazillionaire, <clears throat> sounded a very different tune. Um, the, the normal, you know, the normal argument that they give us is that, you know, uh, move along, move along. Nothing's happening here. Just go on. We, we will, we've taken care of everything, right? Don't worry. All's well. And the mainstream media consistently puts these, you know, Bernanke and his ilk on this pedestal as if we owe them some kind of deference, like we should be praying to them. You notice that when Bernanke's interviewed or anyone talks about the Federal Reserve, they talk about it in these hushed and messianic tones that, you know, the Federal Reserve, it's this big secret, uh, secret organization that, um, they don't use the word secretive, but, you know, that it's a closed organization that um, is always working to stabilize our monetary supply. Well, let me tell you something. The Federal Reserve is exactly who is responsible for the boom and bust cycle that has leached the wealth out of the United States uh, for the past hundred years. They were created with the principle and the concept that they were going to be a way to stabilize currency so that we wouldn't see these boom and bust cycles of, of uh, you know, depressions, right, or recessions. Well, with all due respect, we have had, I think, 82 recessions under the Federal Reserve's watch. That's pretty amazing. And when we talk about the way that these guys operate, uh, it's all in secret. Congress has lost the ability to rein this dog in. Uh, they have to defer to Bernanke, who actually has the unmitigated gall to say, it's none of your business what we do. And they are in absolute dictatorial control of our monetary supply, our monetary policy, our global policy, our domestic policy. They know and create and, and, and balance the debt and interest rates and everything else. And we're not allowed to question them. So anyway, Jim Rogers came out and said the other day that the be happy message is camouflaging the fact that, quote, they're going to take money wherever they can. They're going to take our bank accounts and our retirement accounts. And that, I think, was the real focus of this meeting this year. Here's the problem. There are massive amounts of money and capital tied up in 401ks and retirement accounts by Americans. And they are just chomping at the bit to get at that money. This article is in the New American. I'll put it up on our Facebook and website, and I'll link it to this video. Uh, Greg, Greg Hunter of USA Watchdog says the following. Uh, well, first of all, uh, let me let me go back and, and uh, finish Roger's quote. This is the first time in recorded history all the banks are printing money at the same time. This is the first time we've had massive debasement, and it's going to end very badly no matter what they say, says Rogers. Now, here he goes on to say, whether they keep printing or stop printing money globally, it's going to end badly. Banks are not going to be lending. Financial markets are going to go down. Currency markets are going to be in a great turmoil. It's not going to be any fun. And if the money printing continues, you've got bubbles in some sectors. You have inflation, and then you have interest rates going up. And it's a mess because printing money is artificial. It's never worked. 
As the economy slows down, they're going to take money wherever they can. They're going to take our bank accounts and retirement accounts. We're in, uh, we've had perilous times, and it's going to get worse. It's coming. Be worried. Be careful. Wow. It's quite a statement, isn't it? Now, this guy is, you know, <clears throat> I'm not saying he's completely right. I, I, I think he's right in the overall scenario. The question is, what's the timetable and how will it go down? And he's not being specific about it, but he's absolutely correct that the overall scenario is that this cannot end well. We have more debt that the United States alone is responsible for than the entire country is worth. If we were able to collectively take the United States of America and say that we're going to sell that to some folks from Planet Vigo, and we negotiated the price, it would be less than the total assets of, or, or less than the total debt. In other words, the assets that the United States of America owns are less than we can actually get for the debt. We can't, it, we, we're insolvent. It's like sitting there and saying, I owe $600,000 on my house but the house is worth $325,000. Well, you know, nobody's going to bail you out in that scenario. I mean, who's going to give you $600,000 for a $300,000 house? No one. And that's the scenario we're in. We owe $600 billion, trillion, and nobody's going to bail us out. <clears throat> and, and you see... The problem is that the American people are going to be sapped here because we're going to get stuck with the interest rates going up. And then as, as, as things decline and degrade, that's when they're going to start taking money out of 401ks and out of people's private banking scenario. And, and I guarantee you that the, uh, the policy that was set with what happened with the banking seizures in the European Union is going to ripple throughout the entire global currency game like wildfire when markets start to go down. Because the banks are going to say, well, we need this money to make ourselves whole. And governments who are beholden to these banks and frankly propped up by them are going to have to acquiesce. There's no alternative. It's not an option for them. So the other part that is that we got to talk about is why was John Boehner there? I mean, really, why was John Boehner at this event? I'm disturbed by the fact that this guy is theoretically supposed to be, you know, a representative. And... He's supposed to be representing the American people and his own state. But as the Speaker of the House, he is really, uh, you know, highly um, or he's in a position where he can, you know, demand uh, one things happen in the House or not. And so I got to I got to wonder um, at what point has Boehner been compromised? I mean, he's, he and the Senate and, and those guys up there are the reason why we cannot get a, um, an audit of the Fed. Now, the Fed's been in place for 100 years. They've never been audited. They've fought staunchly against every effort to have them audited. Um, you know, you've heard Ron Paul talk about it. You've heard Rand Paul talk about it. You've heard others talk about it, including Ted Cruz. These guys are determined to not allow themselves to be audited. audited. So um, the, the, the real issue here uh, is that when we're talking about John Boehner's appearance there, uh, was he summoned? What kind of backroom deals were cut? What kind of discussions were had with Boehner, 
who runs the house, who, because he runs the house, also runs the purse strings. You see, that's the real clincher here. Harry Reid wasn't there. John Boehner was. It just so happens that the house holds the purse strings for the nation. And it just so happens that the Republicans are in control in the House, and they have routinely betrayed their constituencies by abdicating to the House, to the, the Federal Reserve System. They are the ones who have staunchly defended the Federal Reserve System in contrast to their own constituencies. Um, they're the ones who have fought a Federal Reserve audit. And so now we know that basically Boehner appeared in Jackson Hole to get his marching orders. That's the truth. Why did the press not talk about this? Why has the press not opened up the eyes of America? Why is Jackson Hole a secret? Do you know who else was there on the international front? The governor of the Saudi Arabian Monetary Agency, the Central Bank of the Republic of Turkey, the deputy governor of the Bank of England, the Bank of Poland, the prince, uh, professor at Princeton University, Central Bank of Malta, Monetary and Economic Department, Bank of International Settlements, U.S. Department of the Treasury, <clears throat> Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, European Commission, Bank of Mexico, Bank for International Settlements, Economic Advisor, Hong Kong Monetary Authority, Executive Vice President, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Governor, National Bank of Belgium, Dean and Professor, University of Michigan, Ford School of Public Policy. Oh, boy. Now, there is a CFR member in good standing, turning the minds of American pupils into mush. Governor, Bank of Portugal. Portugal. Governor, Central Bank of Cyprus. Vice President and Senior Policy Advisor, Federal Bank of Dallas. Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, excuse me. Federal Reserve Bank of New York, President. Professor, University of California, Berkeley. Martin Feldstein, the Professor of Economics, Harvard. Former Governor, Bank of Israel. Senior Fellow, Brookings Institute, Donald Cohn. Northwestern University Professor. Professor from the University of Chicago. Professor of the University of Princeton. Bank of Japan. International Monetary Fund. Deutsche Bank. Deutsches Bundesbank. Stanford University, University of Michigan, European Central Bank, Bank of Thailand, Central Bank of Colombia, Central Bank of Chile, Federal Reserve Bank St. Louis, Whitney Advisory Group, Chief Executive Officer, Federal Reserve Board of Governors, Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, U.S. Office of the People's Bank of China. They were there just to explain why they're no longer willing to buy any of our currency. All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about two issues, this race issue. But there's also some breaking news out here this morning that Obama has issued two new executive orders on firearms, and we're going to talk about those. Um, gun owners are not going to be happy. The Second Amendment's under full-blown assault, folks, and you need to know about that. And You need to know what we're going to do to have to take steps against it before we actually have to deploy the principle of mutually assured destruction.